Hey, hey, one, two. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, standing here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the, uh, managing my presentation? Oh, uh, yeah, you will have a clicker. Okay, I'll have a clicker. Uh, if you come up with me, I'll show you. Okay.
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the first conference on emerging technologies for global food security. So for the people who are just uh, moving in now, if we can uh, see if we can find a seat for you. We've got a pretty much a full house for this conference, which we're very pleased about. Um, and uh, we've got an exceptional program of speakers. Um, just to start, I would like to say we couldn't possibly be here were it not for the generosity of uh, Potash Corporation and the government of Saskatchewan. They are um, really the founding funders of the Global Institute for Food Security and we really thank them from the bottom of our hearts for making all of this possible. Uh, we have many other sponsors that you will hear about during the meeting. Um, it's been uh, uh, e enormously encouraging just to see the number of uh, organizations, national and international, that have supported uh, this, uh, this conference. My name is uh, Morris Maloney, and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Global Institute for Food Security, uh, who are the main sponsor of the conference. We are running this conference uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at AgWest Bio, uh, here in Saskatoon, and many people know Wolf Keller, who is the, the CEO of AgWest. Now, the inspiration for this conference began quite a few years ago, to be honest, before I even came to GIFS. Um, and that was a time when I was the director of Rothamsted Research in the UK. Uh, it's uh, um, the oldest continuously functioning agricultural research center in the world. And while I was there, we talked a lot about food security and about our role as research scientists. And it was really on the heels of a major report from the Royal Society, which has become known as the Balkan Report, um, in which questions associated with the mobilization of discovery science were really raised. And that was, that was to us one of the big questions. How important is discovery research? to the developing world. Surely it was far too high tech to be able to mobilize things easily and uh, the cost associated with it would be out of the question for many people in the developing world. But it was through discussions with uh, my colleague uh, John Pickett, who's here uh, and a speaker uh, at this conference, who explained to me the origin and the implementation of push-pull technology in maize cultivation with uh, Professor Zair Khan, who is also here and will be a speaker at the conference and will talk about this innovation. And push-pull, as you will learn in this conference, is a, a quintessential example of the mobilization of discovery research directly into the field. It's a cutting-edge series of discoveries that allowed this to happen, but it's had enormous impact on maize cultivation in East Africa. About the same time, I uh, heard a brilliant talk by Sigrid Hoyer, who's also here. She was at IRI at the time, the International Rice Research Institute, now in, in, in Adelaide. She's speaking at this conference. And she talked about uh, developing uh, flooding tolerance rice and the isolation of a gene called a sub-1 gene, which was mobilized in a very short period of time, making a difference to rice farmers in Asia. One or two more examples, TJ Higgins' work, TJ is also here on insect resistance in cowpea uh, in West Africa. It convinced me that there is a clear path for discovery research to move directly into the developing world. And that it is much more a question of mindset, just our orientation towards our research, rather than massive technological complexity or cost. So here we find ourselves uh, this week in sunny Saskatoon. Um, as we pay our taxes in this province, the Ministry of Weather has laid on some very good weather for us, and we're thankful to the province for that. Um, but we have now the opportunity to discuss the science, the challenges, and indeed the obstacles to the implementation of many of the science, uh, scientific discoveries that we will talk about. Our cause is noble. We do want to feed the world, but the path to feeding the world must be paved with thoughtful analysis and open-mindedness. We shall debate some of these ideas uh, in play today um, in a public forum with world experts, 
and it will be moderated by one of our intellectual national treasures, Rex Murphy. And uh, we very much look forward to that debate uh, a little bit later on in the afternoon. However, by Thursday evening, I hope that we'll have learned from each other, we'll have built new alliances and conceived of new plans that will help us meet the challenge of feeding 9.6 billion people by 2050. Welcome to all our international and national visitors. Thank you for the great generosity of our sponsors. And we are very proud to host this conference in Saskatchewan, which is the agri agricultural heartland of Canada. Thank you. And now I'm going to call upon a few folks just to say words of welcome that are very relevant uh, to uh, this city and the, and the theme of the conference. First of all, let me call upon uh, Randy Burton from Potash Corp, uh, who will bring uh, greetings from uh, Potash Corporation and also tell us a little bit about their work in global food security. Randy. Thanks, Morris. Wonderful to be here today. I just want to wish everyone, all the visitors to Saskatoon and Saskatchewan, a warm welcome today. As you know, this is Gordy Howe's birthplace, home to hockey, 100,000 lakes, and 38 million acres of farmland. So we know a little bit about farming, I think. And of course, we're home to potash, which is what I'm here to speak to you about today. Potash Corp, as you may know, is the world's largest fertilizer company, producing the three primary crop nutrients, potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. Aside from being our namesake, potash is the core of our business. We have our corporate headquarters and five world-class potash mines here, which together represent about 20% of global capacity. As I mentioned, we've also got world-scale phosphate and nitrogen operations located in several spots in the U.S. and in Trinidad. But we think of ourselves as more than just a fertilizer producer. We feel we make an important contribution to food security, both here at home and in the developing world. Approximately half of world food production is directly attributable to fertilizers. When you think about that, it's really quite astounding. Without fertilizer, nearly half the world's food couldn't be produced. That's a huge contribution, but we know there's still a lot more to do. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, almost 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. Most of them are in the developing world, but the hungry are with us right here at home as well, and more than we might think. It's an ongoing challenge, but it's only part of the picture. As Morris pointed out, the world's population is growing to more than 9 billion by 2050, so that means in less than 35 years there's going to be another 2 billion mouths to feed. In order to meet the need, we're going to have to increase food production by more than 60% from what we do today. And we have to do that while meeting at least three key challenges. We have limited arable land available. We have limited water supplies in many parts of the world. And we have to produce a great amount of new food in an environmentally sustainable way. The way we do that is by addressing the yield gap. That is the difference between what many countries currently produce and what their actual larger potential is. You'll be talking about some of the answers to that question here over the next few days. It's obviously going to include research and development, new technologies, and more productive seeds, among other things. But an important part of the answer will also be the responsible use of fertilizers. In order to increase world food production in a sustainable way, farmers will need to use the right fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time, in the right place. This 4R strategy is a focus within the fertilizer industry and something we talk about a lot. Greater food production and environmental sustainability are not mutually exclusive. The two can and must go hand in hand if we're to meet the challenges ahead. We know that many soils around the world and here in North America are deficient in nutrients, particularly potash. Achieving a better balance of soil nutrients will be an essential part of the solution to the food production problem. We also know that the world is not invested enough in research. In order to feed a growing world, we need more research into improving yields through improved fertilizer and nutrient use efficiency. We work through a number of fertilizer industry agencies, as well as with the Global Institute for Food Security, as, as Morris mentioned. As a founding partner of GIFS, we will play a role in the contributions it can make in the years ahead. 
Beyond our role in research and innovation, we also try to raise awareness and make a contribution through our community investment program, both at home and abroad. Internationally, we have partnered with organizations like Free the Children to bring positive food solutions to the forefront in the developing world. Potash Corp is the founding partner of the agriculture and food security pillar within Free the Children's International Development Program. With them, we partner on projects in a number of developing countries, such as China, India, and Africa. These projects are aimed at increasing food security in local communities and training local farmers in a range of improved agricultural techniques. But as I mentioned earlier, hunger and food insecurity are not limited to developing countries. We have those issues right here at home. Between 2008 and 2015, for example, food bank usage in Saskatchewan has risen by more than 50%. They currently serve more than 28,000 people per month. 45% of those clients are children. That's why we also support local food banks and other hunger programs in all the areas where we operate within Saskatchewan, the U.S., and Trinidad. This money goes to food relief, but it also supports at-risk individuals through training programs, career counseling, and other services. As I said at the outset, we see ourselves as more than a crop nourishment company. We also see ourselves as nourishing human potential. I'll wrap up now by showing you a video we shot last year around the International Year of the Soils that was declared by the United Nations. It encapsulates a lot of what I've been talking about here today. Thanks very much. Everyone needs a reason to get out of bed each morning. A real reason. Beyond a paycheck or a mounting to-do list. For those of us in the business of feeding and fueling our growing world, the lucky ones, that reason is all too clear. While you were asleep last night, more than 30,000 people joined the ranks of the human population. Another 170,000 will be with us by the time you lay your head down on the pillow tonight. Yet, the real challenge of our soaring population is not making room for everyone. There is plenty of land for that. Rather, the real challenge is making enough food for everyone. Over the next 30 years alone, we need to produce more food than in the last 10,000 years combined. And there is precious little farmable land left in this world capable of delivering these vital needs. Which means what little farmland we do have needs a lot of care and feeding. Little wonder the United Nations has named 2015 the International Year of Soils. Because soil, without question, is one of the world's most precious natural resources. As the world's largest producer of crop nutrients, Potash Corp has long been committed to keeping soils healthy. Because when soils are healthy, crop yields grow. When soils are healthy, small businesses grow. When soils are healthy, community investment grows. In fact, when soils are healthy, entire economies grow. The way we see it, when Potash Corp nourishes the soil, what we're really nourishing is human potential, which should help everyone rest a little easier tonight. Potash Corp, helping nature provide So thank you very much, Randy, and thanks to Potash Corp for uh, uh, the, uh, the opening remarks. Um, I said we're very proud to have this conference here in Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon. There's nobody more proud of this than uh, His Worship, our Mayor, uh, Don Aitchinson, and uh, I'd like him to come along and say a few words uh, to, uh, to welcome everybody here to this lovely city. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be with you. I noticed, first of all, it said a few words. Uh, so we'll try to be as brief as possible. It's great to be with you, though, to be able to, in fact, be on Treaty 6 territory, along with the homeland of the Métis. I have a quick story I want to tell you, and it's a story, and it'll all tie together. I went to the store one day to purchase something, and when I was in the store, I pulled out my wallet to pay, and in my wallet, I only had half a $20 bill. Well, this half a $20 bill isn't worth $10. It's worth absolutely nothing because I don't have the other side with the serial numbers on it. 
Went home to find the other half, couldn't find it. Year one went by, two, three. Said to my wife, Mardell, if I throw this half out, Murphy's Law is the other half will appear tomorrow. So I better keep it. I better keep on hoping that something good will happen. Year four went by, year five this year at Christmas time. I got an anonymous Christmas card and the other half was the $20 bill. I now have $20. Before I had nothing. And it's like so many things in life that if we don't work together and focus in the same direction, we have absolutely nothing. Here in the city of Saskatoon, for example, we had some land that a friend of mine one day phoned me and said, you know, you've got nothing but weeds on it. Uh, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, next year we'll try and do a better job. He said, why don't you let me grow potatoes on it? And I said, well, if milk grows potatoes on it, that means he won't call me about the weeds and everyone will be really happy. So consequently, we did. Over six years now, we have grown on this particular piece of land, 100,000 pounds of food, and we've been able to send that all to the food bank to those that truly need the food in the end. And the reason I tell you that story too is because of the city of Saskatoon and the volunteers we have that in fact are looking after that land. Saskatoon is known as the volunteer capital of North America. And all you have to do is look at all the different events we put on and people give freely of their time and they ask nothing in return but perhaps maybe a thank you. And while you're in Saskatoon, there are so many other things to do. I'm hoping you're going to get to go to the Light Source Synchrotron. Um, that is an absolutely wonderful project. That's that project there. The city of Saskatoon is the only city in the world that, in fact, granted $2.4 million and asked for nothing in return, other than that it becomes very successful here in our community, and truly it will be over a period of time, and I think that will be wonderful for the food industry as well. You really do play an important part when we hear about the, the growth that's going on here in Saskatoon too. We've had growth over the years and we continue to grow and prosper. Saskatoon over the past 15 years, 90,000 people have moved to Saskatoon. In fact, there have been 50,000 jobs created here in the past 10 years. And the city of Saskatoon opens and is in re receptive to having people move here to be with us from all over. It's just a great place to live. Being the mayor of Saskatoon is really something that is quite very unique and very fortunate that I've been given that opportunity. And while you're here in Saskatoon, we hope that you'll walk just a few feet away from here. Uh, it's actually a couple hundred yards and you'll see a statue of Gabriel Dumont. You'll also see the founders, Chief Whitecap and John Lake, statues of them too. And we believe this is the only place in Canada where you can actually see the statues of uh, an Aboriginal leader, a Canadian leader, a European leader, and a Métis, all within a few feet of each other. There is so much to do in our city, I could be up here forever, but they told me, do you think you could keep it brief? <laughs> but, you know, we want to really encourage you to, to come back to Saskatoon once again to experience us. So once again, on behalf of all the citizens of Saskatoon, to our visitors from around the world, that when you leave Saskatoon, that we hope that you're going to take warm and fond memories of our community with you. We'd ask that you come back sooner rather than later to be with us once again. And the work that you're doing here today is so critical. It's kind of like my $20 bill. Without the research that you're doing, without food security that you're doing, and the population the way it is growing today, we truly need to be able to work together. And by you doing that, we are getting focused and going in that same direction, just as you're doing with this conference right now. And by doing that, we will truly become successful. So once again, thank you ever so much for having me here and congratulations to the volunteers, to the sponsors and because of that, the city of Saskatoon will truly shine and remember the $20 bill. By working together, we'll have so much more. Thanks ever so much and have a great day. Well, thank you, Mayor Atchison, and uh, I'll collect that $20 bill a bit later, I need it. <laughs> so uh, our uh, next speaker to bring greetings from the University of Saskatchewan is uh, our Vice President of Research, uh, Dr. Karen Chad. And uh, I've worked uh, closely with Karen from the day I arrived, and it's been a pleasure every day working with her. And I'm sure she will have a few words of enlightenment about the start of our conference. Karen.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a great pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome to you all from far and wide, and I hope that in your next couple of days, you will take a moment of opportunity to stroll across the river and have an opportunity to visit our beautiful campus. I was absolutely delighted to be able to partake in the next couple of days because this critically important meeting will help set the agenda for tackling the grand challenge in global agriculture today. The conference actually reads like a veritable who's who of top food security experts in various fields from across Saskatchewan, from across Canada, and indeed across the globe. And thank you, I want to congratulate and thank Morris Maloney and our key partners for organizing this stellar line of speakers. And as well to thank my esteemed colleagues and august leaders who I have the privilege to share this podium with. We know, as is mentioned earlier, that food production must double by 2050 to meet the demands of the world's growing population. Whether the daunting challenge of this goal happens to be drought, pests, or plant diseases, we do know this. Research will be a part and must be a part of the solution. At the University of Saskatchewan, we take very seriously our responsibility, actually our moral and social responsibility as a leading Canadian research intensive university to help address these challenges, leveraging our local expertise for global impact. Success in finding solutions involves recognizing three very important key imperatives in today's challenging and changing international research environment. The first, the first is that a challenge like global food security is far too big for any one government, any one industry, or any one university to solve on their own. For this reason, I am delighted that this conference brings together so many different people from across academe, industry, and government. Research partnerships with governments, with companies, and with communities are critical to ensuring that our lab discoveries and new insights are translated into new products and new policies, and that these meet our community needs both here and across the globe. Secondly, research teams that tackle complex, multi-dimensional problems like global food security must indeed be multidisciplinary, spanning the spectrum from the social sciences to health and science disciplines to policy research. At the University of Saskatchewan, bioscience-related expertise and research spans seven important and relevant colleges, three graduate schools, and numerous research centers, including the Global Institute for Food Security, the Global Institute for Water Security, the Fedoric Nuclear Innovation Center, and our own Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. With a field-to-fork approach, our researchers work with communities, producers, and companies helping to grow the province's egg bioscience research and development investment from both private and public sectors and producer groups. It already exceeds a staggering $241 million. Thirdly, finding solutions requires that the best and the brightest minds are here. Competition for research talent has become highly competitive as more countries are realizing the huge economic and social benefits of research. At the University of Saskatchewan, with our audacious egg bioscience research goals, we are attracting top faculty, top graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom are drawn to our campus by the presence of our world-class imaging facilities, such as the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron and the Saskatchewan Centre for Cyclotron Sciences. 
a feather in our provincial cap, um, is most recently being awarded only one of five Canada First Research Excellence Fund grants, a new federal program that positions universities to excel in economically important areas. Our just over $37 million grant is titled Designing Crops for Global Food Security, and we are using it to create a most unique plant phenotyping and imaging research center. This center, we are privileged and pleased to have led by Dr. Morris Maloney. It will build on our collective research strengths to undertake transformative research while training more than 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. With our, pro uh, with our prominence in agricultural research, training and innovation, we are uniquely positioned to enable Saskatchewan to be a global leader in ag bioscience by 2020, supplying new crop varieties to a hungry world. But as I mentioned before, we cannot and will not do this on our own. We have proven, however, that we can make a difference in this province. I thought you might be interested in just three quick examples. First, our Crop Development Centre has developed 400 commercialized crop varieties, enabling our agricultural industry to better compete in a broad world grains market. Second, University of Saskatchewan research has been the main driver of Saskatchewan's now billion dollar pulse crop industry. If we think back, it was only 20 years ago pulse crops such as lentils and peas were a minor part of the province's agricultural production. Today, Saskatchewan contributes 58% of the world's lentil exports and contributes 55% of the world's pea exports. Third, University of Saskatchewan crop research has increased the productivity from Saskatchewan agricultural lands. Back in 1970, the majority of Saskatchewan's productive land was under summer fallow, generating no income at all for producers. Since then, crop diversification from University of Saskatchewan developed varieties as well as development of seeding equipment and technologies for precise seed and fertilizer placement have significantly reduced Saskatchewan's acreage under summer fallow, increasing, increasing the seeding acreage by 40%. The results are threefold. More land being used to produce food, higher returns for farmers, and more crop choices for producers than ever before. Estimates are that this decrease in fallow land alone has had an impact on the Saskatchewan economy of $50 billion since 1970. This last example really underscores the real value of research and innovation. Our future economic success as a province, as a country, and indeed the world will depend increasingly on such new knowledge and innovation. You, every single one of you in this room, are doing exciting and imaginative work at the forefront of your fields. I wish you, each and every one of you, and you collectively the very best as you together work towards global food security. Thank you very much. Now you've probably figured out by now that this province is a very agriculturally friendly province and many of my colleagues, international colleagues around the world will say uh, it's sometimes difficult to get their governments to really focus on funding agricultural research and I've got to say in this province agricultural research takes a very high profile. And that is in great part because of the influence of our next and final uh, introductory speaker here, Alana Cook. And Alana is the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, although she's destined in a few weeks also to become the Deputy Minister to the Premier of the province. And uh, Alana 
Uh, he's just going to bring greetings from the province and tell you a little bit about the province's commitment to agriculture and food security. Thanks very much, Morris, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such a full room. And uh, on behalf of uh, Premier Bradwall, Agriculture Minister Lyle Stewart, as well as uh, the Government of Saskatchewan, just a big, warm Saskatchewan welcome to all of you. Uh, and thank you so much for making this conference a priority. I'm very excited to be here and be part of uh, the conversation, and I'm confident that the conversations that happen over the next couple of days will help to develop a stronger and more collaborative approach to addressing the food security challenges that we face. While some of you are part of our dynamic uh, bioscience cluster right here in Saskatoon, I know that many of you have traveled a great distance to be here with us. As you likely saw when your plane arrived, our province has a lot of farmland. We have 40% of, of Canada's available farmland right here in Saskatchewan. Now that is only one reason why Saskatchewan is viewed as an agriculture leader. We're also home to some of the most productive, efficient, and innovative farmers in the world. Year after year, our farmers and ranchers produce high quality crops and livestock. We're Canada's leader in many commodities like pulses, canola, and durum, and we're also the top agri-food exporting province in Canada. Now, Randy mentioned potash, and I mean, there's, there's a close link to agriculture there. So, as you can see, we help to feed a growing world population by exporting high quality goods to over 145 countries around the world. We've been able to accomplish this because of the network of professionals working to advance knowledge and technology in areas such as crop genetics, including agriculture biotechnology. And most of that bioscience and research cluster is here in Saskatoon. Our research and agriculture bioscience community has developed various global innovations that enhance operations and help the environment. Now, just a few decades ago, Saskatchewan was the birthplace for so many advancements in zero tillage, including equipment and crop innovation. And we continue to lead the world today in continued innovations in crop rotation. Karen spoke about uh, the change from summer follow and how much more land is now in active and healthy production. Now, zero tillage is an example of something that has improved soil quality and the sequestering of carbon. Zero till is now a well-accepted production practice in various parts of the world, including places like Australia. Saskatchewan also has a long history of adopting new crops, such as canola and pulses. In fact, canola was developed right here in Western Canada, and over the last 40 years has become one of our most important crops. And to think, in the 1980s, pulse crops didn't even exist here in Saskatchewan. Karen talked about this change and this increased production of, of pulse crops. So it was when the need to increase the supply of pulses to meet the global demand arose, that's when we accepted the challenge. And we're now the largest producer of pulses in Canada and the world's largest pulse exporter. Pulse crops are not only good for consumers' health, they're good for the environment as well. Pulses are an affordable and versatile staple food for many people in the world. And these success stories are a result of Saskatchewan's advantages. We have the natural resources such as land and water to provide the ideal growing conditions. We have a strong agriculture research and bioscience community. We have innovative farmers who are quick and eager to adopt new technology. And we have a government that is very supportive and embraces all that it's going to take to have the tools and technology available to us to feed the world's growing population. Because of this ideal combination, our province is in an ideal position to develop Saskatchewan-led solutions to feed the world. Investing in research and Saskatchewan-led solutions has remained a government priority. This is why the Global Institute for Food Security was created. The organization will continue to build on Saskatchewan's success and develop ways to share our innovation and knowledge on a global scale. That is why it's so appropriate that this conference is here in Saskatoon, here in Saskatchewan. Our government recognizes that we need science-based regulations to make sure that our farmers and ranchers have access to the tools and technologies they need to grow food. All of us will be at an incredible disadvantage if we don't have the ability to use modern science in food production. That is why in Saskatchewan, working hard to gain public trust for modern food production. Consumers have a lot of information 
and misinformation to navigate through. We, as an industry, need to speak up about what we do and why we do it that way. It's part of gaining and keeping what we call our social license. And I encourage all of us in our roles to be a part of that conversation. Not having a social license will affect growth and innovation. It will result in practices that are not sustainable and this will hurt our economy. But most importantly, it will limit the production of food needed to feed the growing world. Research has shown that shared values are three to five times more important than fact when consumers are forming their opinions. Now obviously, accurate science-based facts are vital, but we need to find the balance of leveraging those facts by more effectively communicating how this relates to the shared values of our industry as well as the consuming public. We clearly all have shared values here today, and I think that's very powerful. I encourage you to share these values as you talk to a wider audience about what we hope to accomplish and how we're going to get there. Again, thank you very much for attending this conference and having this global discussion. I know for Saskatchewan, our journey in helping to achieve global food security is only beginning. We're proud to be a leader in the development of technology that changes the way food is produced, but we're even more proud to be a national leader in advancing agriculture's social license and a part of the discussion on how we bring this technology to the global community. I look forward to seeing what is accomplished here at this conference this week as well as in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Alana, and again, a, uh, um, a, an important tip of the hat to this province because it is sincerely one of the great provinces across Canada that is supporting agricultural research as, uh, as one of its uh, core themes. So now we move into uh, the, the, uh, the real meat of our conference and uh, um, we're going to start out with uh, sessions um, that are going to be managed by my colleague here, uh, Anne Roulin. Now, Anne is the Vice President of Sustainability of Nestle uh, in uh, Veve in Switzerland. Uh, I've known her for many, many years. She is a very accomplished chemist and polymer chemist, an entrepreneur, a business builder, um, and also we never even thought that we would end up working precisely on the same side towards global food security. So it is a real pleasure to have Anne on the stage uh, to manage the coming session. Anne. So thank you very much, Maurice. It's a real pleasure to be here. And we certainly have a fascinating program ahead of us. And I'm really looking forward to the presentations and the debates that will ensue on this crucial subject. But it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this conference, Ruth Onyango. Ruth has had a very distinguished career. She served on the boards of many different organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for Agricultural St Strategy, the International Fer Fertilizer Development Centre, the Board of IRI, and also IFBRI. And she currently serves on the Nestle Board, as well as our Creating Shared Value Advisory Council. Ruth has received many distinguished awards, including Fortune Magazines as one of the most innovative women in food and drink. Ruth is currently Adjunct Professor of Nutrition at Tufts University, in the US. And I think it's very appropriate that Ruth is the opening speaker of this conference, as she's done so much to pr promote food and nutrition security in the developing world. So I'd like to welcome Ruth, and she's going to present on three decades of working with a community to return to food and nutrition security in Western Kenya. So thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you, Anne. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope I can see you. I come from Kenya, so we say jumbo. And please relax, yeah? 
I like people to relax. I've come a long way, thanks to Morris, whom I met a little over a year ago, and he mentioned this conference, and then he went quiet, and I said, I hope he doesn't come back. <laughs> and then he came back. And fortunately, I didn't look at the map to see where Saskatoon was. <laughs> because I wouldn't have come. Just wanted to show you where. OK. Um, I don't like PowerPoints, by the way. They have let me down many times before. But I just have to show I put some work into this presentation. I just can't come all this way without having to prepare for it. So I have people in my team who assisted me. But I wanted to show you. Look at that. So I was asking myself when I checked in, Saskatoon, the lady said, where is that? I said, Canada, oh. Then Paris, OK, for eight hours, eight and a half hours, Kenya Airways. In Paris, four hours. Then Air Canada to Toronto, eight hours. Then, oh, in Toronto, three hours. Then to Saskatoon, three and a half hours. Wow, look at so many miles. It is nice to be here. I, rem I, remember, I remember my geography. We learned about Saskatchewan. I remember in high school producing a lot of wheat. I remember, I think they still produce a lot of wheat. So, and I saw your mayor on TV the other day, he sounded so good. The mayor was actually talking about diversity and what a great city this is. And then I went, walked around, it felt like Nairobi. And I felt, I guess, I guess it's okay, yeah? So thank you for having me here, Morris, and everyone else. I, I, I serve on those boards, not because I'm an expert, no way. I know because I'm special in any way, not at all. People just know I ask too many questions. So I say, ah, okay, bring her, then she can ask all the good questions. And then we can maybe do something about what she asks. I spend all my life talking about nutrition, nutrition. You know, I won a scholarship to go to the US. I was one out of five, the only girl. And then I ended up in Pullman, Washington State, it was so far away from my parents, you know? And when I went back, if you asked me with my master's degree, uh, uh, you know, what are you going to do when you go back to Africa? I said, I'll read Africa of all that malnutrition. Can you imagine I'm still fighting and I'll go to my grave still fighting? Because I'd seen children with kwashoko and marasmas and big tummies full of worms, you know? And I said, and I know the hunger pangs, and I know it's not right for anyone to be hungry. Then I come to North America, too much food, <laughs> too much choice. You go to the supermarket, you can't even make up your mind. You know, you get your servings, and I say, can I just get a small salad? When it's a small salad, it's a big plate like this. And each time I eat here, I think of the people who are going hungry, you know, all these years. So that's what I do, you know. But it's been an okay journey. So I went back to Kenya, and I started to teach at the university to do research and, and so on. And look, when I reached about 40 years old, the lifespan of Kenyans was about 44. So I knew I would be dying soon. I say, and in my culture, when you die, you are in Nairobi, you actually go back and you are buried in your village. So I said, so when they bury me, they'll be looking at me, and they'll be saying, what has she ever done for us? We brought her up, she went away, and she came back, and now we have to bury her, and what is all this? And that's what actually informed me starting the, the NGO. So I, I started the NGO because I was afraid that I would be buried by people who didn't know who I was and who were hungry and who have come there just because they can eat some food. 
So I started this NGO, and it is a, just part of the story that I'm going to share with you. But I like the, 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 the messages that have been coming up to the, from the previous speakers that we really have to work in partnership. We can all help each other. And it's not all lost. And I can tell you that my speech now is very different from what it used to be. I was complaining. I went back to Kenya. I couldn't travel around Africa because to go to another African country, you are to go into Europe and then back to Africa. But it's a lot better now. And for those of you who come from Kenya, who have come from Africa, and there are some here, I know you, you are here already. OK, hands up, anybody who has been on the African continent. Hands up. You see, you see, you didn't just Google it, right? So it's not too far away, yeah? It's not too far away. It's a lot easier now, I must say. It's a lot easier now. It's frustrating for someone like me who decided to stay on the continent, but I've seen a lot of changes, and I know especially young people. I meet young people in the rural areas you know, where there's no electricity, no proper toilet. You know, it's pit latrine. But at least if you're in Kenya, you can internet. You can call your parents from anywhere, thank God, for the internet, you know? Yeah, so I'm happy the internet is here and I'm, uh, I'm able to enjoy it uh, before I, I call it quits. But the young people, the millennials, you know, are daring to go. And now they come to what has always been known as the dark continent, you know? Unfortunately, it's dark and dark people. Sub-Saharan Africa. Yet, yet, I see many opportunities. Many opportunities for research. Many opportunities to make a difference. Many opportunities stop you from being bored. And many opportunities to apply all these nice technologies. So long as you understand the culture. It's a complicated continent, by the way. So let me show you. That's Africa. Do you know it is 54 countries? Sub-Saharan. 54 countries. Not a China. You know where you have one regulation? And I'm just showing you where Kenya is. So many tribes, so many regulations, so many languages, very complicated. The green, even the Green Revolution couldn't work there. We need to call it a different kind of a revolution. So what happened then was that uh, I started uh, an NGO way back in the early 90s. And the idea was, uh, let me go back to my people. I travel a lot. I come back. And let me do something in a small way where I come from. I don't have to go too far. I don't have to reach the whole world. If I can point out someone to you whose life has been changed because of what we have done, then I, 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 I will not mind to have done that. So my area was actually growing sugarcane. But previously, these pulses you are talking about in Saskatchewan, we also had all these legumes, very rich diet. Otherwise, I would be stunted, you know, because it had a good diet. We were eating all this. They are not there anymore. We are just trying to bring them back. But they went into sugarcane production. Ten years later, there were signs of hunger, signs of malnutrition in the same area. And yes, the so-called develop, development was there because now you could see corrugated iron sheet houses. You could see people with bicycles. Still, the roads were too bad. There was no power. You know, children could be sent to school. You know, but I, I, I did action research while I was at the university, and it was following the results of that research that I decided then to have this uh, NGO. But. What I discovered as I went in is that young people, is better to intervene with them in school rather than working with much older people whose minds are already set. 
They are happy to be poor. They are happy to live in their little houses. But at the end of the day, the children just want to be like me and be able to fly and go to different parts of the world. So I work a lot with young people. We hold field days. We have a mission there. I'll go through this quickly. I love the women. You can rely on the women any time. You can rely on an African woman any time. The men, I'm not sure of. Yeah, I don't know what they do. So I work with the women. Three quarters of who I work with are women. And the men, I love you and I'll give you an award if you support the women. And I tell them, I, you like to be heads of households, but the women are the backbone and there's no head without a backbone. My age has helped me as I age now, so I'm just like the men. Anyway, I'm better than the men as I age because the women in Africa, by the way, the older women are listened to more than the men. Yeah, their word is final. So for the first time now when I'm in the village, I don't mind being this age. So we intervene through the women. We do a lot with the women, but we do it in a way that we don't put them at risk. We make sure the men also support them. We make sure the administration, the local governments, the opinion leaders also support the women. And we show them what the women are capable of. And really, after three decades, finally, I think it's paying off. It's making a huge difference. Because with very little money, the women will feed their families, will feed the same men that don't do anything, will make sure their children go to school, will save and will have money when nobody expects them to have money. So my message there is we don't have enough financing for women. We don't have enough support for women. We don't have enough donors who come and help those of us who work with the women. It's a lot of it rhetoric, by the way. Yet all research findings show, especially in, the Af in Africa, that if you want to make a difference, you work with the women. Water, we start with water. Water is life. Can you imagine water? We still get that kind of water? How can you avoid disease when you drink that kind of water? So we go into a community using water. Water is apolitical, it's nonpartisan. Everybody likes water. The men get involved in excavating. It's an old technology just to get that clean water. The government has a big program for water, but at the end of the day, when we work with very little money, the community involved, we get clean water. It saves the women as well. Hospital, you know, healthcare. I go around North America and hospitals are empty, actually. You don't see emergencies, you know, unless there has been an accident or someone is suffering a heart attack. But beds full in a hospital? No. But here, people die from very little things. Malaria, high fever, diarrhea. A woman producing, she has to be carried on a wheelbarrow. A woman died in my car. She was called Ruth, and it just, it has never left my head. So we've been putting up a community hospital, making sure there's water as well to help the community. My message here is that it's not just agriculture, by the way. No wonder we haven't done much to make a difference. You don't just go say this is a technology, produce more food, let's feed the children. The women will be asking you, okay, how does my child go to school? Where is the hospital? I need one around, yeah? So you just have to be involved in the community. And when you are a professor or a, you have a doctorate, you are a doctor, you are a doctor for everything. Maybe you are the only one in that village. So they rely on you. So they rely on me, so I make use of my connections. And, you know, so what I do is my own uh, personal capital. I actually is present in that, yeah. So, yes, nutrition, critical, but if the water is no good, it can't be. And then we get some funding. Right now we have some funding to work on soils. And for those of you who are soil scientists, by the way, I'm not a plant scientist. I'm not a soil scientist. I'm food science, nutrition. But I started asking myself, where does the food come from? Who produces it? I discovered it's the women. What are they eating? How do we encourage them to eat? Where are they growing more? They may have only a quarter of an acre of land, 
but they can produce more. Why are the yields are higher? You know? So that's how we started going backward. Now, that's a huge difference. And thank God when I worked, I, 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 I was on the IFDC board, that's when I understood soils. Those are the ones they invited me to be on the board. I said, what am I going to do with soils? I don't know anything about soils. I said, oh, Ruth, you know, you just asked the, the right question. So I started to look at the soils. Yeah, that's, you know, those, those are the women, you know, a medical camp and some of that education, value chain, saving what you produce, food safety. I would go to the village, they have harvested maize. This was a, a running story. They sell it immediately, otherwise weevils will, will affect it. Finally, I came across these pig bags, you know, the Padua bags for actually keeping the maize. Now they are shocked. They are shocked after a year. No chemical application. The maize is whole. It has no weevils. And the farmers are encouraged. They can keep their one bag, their two bags. They can sell when the price is good. They can eat good food, which does not have chemicals. Because cancer has become endemic, and they are blaming it on GMO, on all kinds of things, on Western food. Yeah, look at that maze now. They are enjoying their maze now. They can see it. Yeah? So, soya bean. Soya bean was finally accepted. Why? Because it's good for the soil. Coming from North America, knowing soybean is the only plant source that is equivalent to, to whose, whose protein is equivalent to meat, you know, and we try to promote it, they say no way. But they were actually able to take this. We tried it on the soils. The next season, the produce, the yields were better. They said, oh, if these soybeans are good for our soils, then they must be good for us. Completely unexpected. Completely unexpected. So we teach how to use soya bean and how to eat it, how to improve nutrition. And it is also helping in their soils. And they are realizing soils are important. So what have we learned so far? Culture. I'm coming to, to almost to the end. But the culture, understanding the culture, even I coming from that community could not say that I understand that culture. I went there to improve child nutrition. And they were asking me, who told you that we don't take good care of our children? Meantime, the children are malnourished. The children have worms. The children don't look good. So I decided to go do something else. Now I can come back to child nutrition. Respect. Dealing with families, communities, respectfully. Mutual respect. You know, if you come imposing because you have your PhD, you have come from wherever, they just laugh at you, you leave, and that's the end of the story. Inclusiveness, yeah, those men I talked about, by the way, I just still involve them because I need them to take care of the women. So I'm very good to them. When they see me, they do the right thing. If I say, I'll come back, you better be still be doing the right thing. Yeah. So then the family unit, you know, get families involved as a whole unit monitoring to review what you have done, going back. And because it is my own area, we are able to expand in the same region, but I'm also able to go back and to see where we have come from over the last three decades. That's how it, long it has taken. But I'm able to take some of those STEM lessons that they cut across. You know, when you talk of respect, it's the same across the world, you know? and uh, the legal environment, working with the government and government policy, and making sure we do the right thing, and having people to value science, to respect science. You know, we can't solve any of the problems we have if we don't respect research. And our budget was just read in Kenya, and it's amazing that no money was put towards agricultural research. I can't believe this. I mean, in the 21st century. Financing for women, I cannot overstate this uh, message. If you truly want to help that continent, you go through the women. And I support women scientists as well. I mentor them whether virtually through my journal or physically. I have them around my office. 
I send them to meetings, I look for fellowships for them, and I do the same for young men, by the way, also. Long term. You know, donors come with three-year projects. I don't know what three years is. If I stuck on three years, I will not be here. So when there's no money, I'm still there, by the way. People need to see you. The first year the money comes, second year the donor wants to visit, last year we won the reports, and that's the end of the story. You go back 10 years later, there's nothing. So financing, if they want to do it, they better be there for the long term. Then sharing knowledge, partnerships, we achieve more when we are collaborating with each other. And whether it is Saskatoon here in Nairobi, you saw the link is there, whether it is what, but I think the rest of the world has a lot to do to share, and that at the end of the day, nutrition and malnutrition affects all of us. Obesity right now is the most endemic form of malnutrition. It's not affecting just the developed world, but it's affecting us, even as we deal with malnutrition still, undernutrition, and, and, and so on. And so we all in this together, and that people are now questioning more and more the quality of what they eat. So you can't anymore just give people food because they're hungry. They want to know what is in there. What is it going to do for me? And so that finally the nutrition I studied, which didn't make sense to many people, the millennials, especially the young people, whether in the north or in the west, are saying, what is in this food? Where does it come from? Now everything is, we want it organic, we want it grown next door, we want it fresh, we want it gluten-free, we want it non-GMO, no chemicals, and at the end of the day, is what are we going to eat? <laughs> but here, you know you have choices, but there are many people without choices. But I think there's enough food to go around. To tell you the truth, there's enough food to go around. Because when I see how much is wasted, I say, oh, maybe it's not wasted. It becomes manure, you know. It becomes fertilizer. <laughs> because it is biogradable. But the will needs to be there. And it takes people like yourselves far away as you are from Africa. I saw, do you grow pineapples here? I saw a pineapple, you know, on my breakfast plate. I thought maybe it came from, maybe I came from, with it from Kenya. So food can move around. It just needs, needs goodwill, political will, but all of us working together. It needs the industry to understand that people need good food, good nutrients, even with the fiber in it, even as it is processed. People need food to be fresh. And <coughs> policymakers to understand and scientists, to allow scientists to do their work. But even as scientists, you have to go beyond your laboratory. Because when you do the science, what, who are you doing it for? If you are an agricultural scientist, who does your work benefit? And I think eventually you get bored. I got bored very easily myself. I stopped working in the lab when I saw the problems in the field. But I value everybody for what we do. Because without what you do, I have nothing to take to the field and try to apply them. So I want you to enjoy this conference. I'll be around throughout. And if you want to come to Nairobi, just let me know. I'll meet you at the airport. You can come to the village. And you'll have fun. And you'll actually make a difference. I, can, I promise you. We have many partners, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, yeah. So thank you very much, Ruth. Mm. Questions for Ruth, please?
It's very bright. I know. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that uh, inspiring uh, discussion. And let me just uh, uh, raise one point that you talked about uh, with respect to food waste. And it's pretty clear uh, in rich countries, you know, in North America and so on, where we have these big plates of food served in the, in the restaurants and then only half of it's eaten, it's probably an awful lot of waste. What do you see in your village um, in terms of uh, food supply and food waste? Is this something that is actually true around the world or is it something that every calorie counts in the, in the places that you know so well? Hmm. Uh, I, I've known that when it is in harvest time and there's plenty of food, they serve a heap of food, a heap of food, but it doesn't get wasted because the dogs have to eat and the chickens and the, everybody eats and the rest of it is thrown to the field, you know, to work as manure. Um, but then a lot of times there is li not enough to go around. And it also depends on where you are. Yeah, it really depends on where you are. But in, in, the, in the rural areas where they grow, yes, the tendency is waste it when you have it and then within four or five months you don't have enough. You mentioned about um, the, the yes, traditional sir. crops had been replaced by sugarcane, mm. and you talked a little bit about soya bean, but mm. what's the progress in getting back to some of the other traditional crops in your area? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, again, this is Western Kenya, you know, a region. Uh, Kenya is a population of 45 million, so Western Kenya is more or less a productive area of uh, about 6 million people, um, and that's where sugarcane has been growing. Actually, farmers themselves are uprooting sugarcane. Mm -hmm. Farmers themselves are uprooting sugarcane mm -hmm. because we are working with them to show them that it's better to grow food. There's demand for food elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, so long as you link them to markets, there's actual demand for food. And it's not just now soya. I gave soya just as an example, mm -hmm. but this is an area which can grow anything and everything. And I know pulses, uh, uh, they want to grow them to export to India. But I'm telling them, but you need the pulses here. So ensure your own food security as well, but it can also act as a, as, as a cash crop. So yes, we are now bringing back the traditional foods and promoting healthier diets. Yeah, that even if you eat from outside, this is a healthy diet and a lot of it you can grow locally and some of what you grow locally, you can sell as well because there's demand for it, yeah. <laughs> What's the acceptance of GMO in Kenya? <laughs> I think we have a session on policy soon. Uh, was, is it Wednesday? Thursday. I think we have a, a session on that. I'll talk about that. But uh, the, it's been a, like a seven-year story. It's been so difficult. But finally, we had a biosafety legislation, and the idea was let's just buy, pass that biosafety legislation because without it, you cannot reject GMO. You cannot say you are accepting or rejecting. So it finally passed. So then the GMO was now, they were allowed, the parliament passed it to be tested in enclosed environment. But just uh, two months ago, it can go into farmers' fields. Uh, and for me, it's not a question of whether I like GMO or not. I travel so much, I'm sure I eat a lot of whatever. Whatever is out there, personally. But I feel that for science to progress, we shouldn't close our minds. I mean, that's the whole idea that I have myself. But uh, the attacks on GMO are there anyway. But we have moved on as a country then, that we can uh, move to farmers' fields. Yeah. Hello. I used to work in Africa about 30 years ago. Mm. And in the 70s, the crop yield of cereals was about one ton per hectare. About 40 years later, there is a progress in some countries such as yours, yeah. Ghana, Zambia, but most countries still one ton per hectare of cereal yield. Yeah. What do you think can you do 
when the you mentioned about the yield gap, yeah. five tons per hectare is possible. Yeah. So what is holding it back? Yeah. As I said earlier, you know, Africa, I wish it was just a China, you know, or an India. Then you just have one, a one people you are dealing with. You know, we have all these, these, I call them artificial boundaries. It, uh, in this, the African Union itself to realize the partnership and that together we start to benefit if we work together and we start, if we harmonize some of the legislation, actually it's the politics which mess, messes up people. And, and so you can come to Kenya where we are more liberal, and so long as we have a policy, you come, you know Ruth, you arrive in a village or whoever else you have in Kenya, and you can do a lot with the farmers. But there's another country, you have to start at the top, by the time you reach the bottom, you have given up. So it's, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. But the scientists, some of you here, who have worked in the villages and with the farmers, you know very well that managing those soils, using those technologies, you can actually make a huge impact in terms of the yields. So I, I think the answer is just in making sure that the African Union does what it's supposed to do, and at the country level, we work with the communities, and we are able to do that and make a difference. Well, a very big thank you to Ruth, thank and you. plenty of time to interact with her during the conference. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> So it's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Gary Stacey, who is Endowed Professor of Soybean Microtechnology at the Euro University of Missouri. Gary's research focuses on the symbiosis between specific bacteria and the host plant soya beans and how this relates to the induction of plant innate immunity. Gary is involved in many associations, including the American Society for the Advancements of Science, the American Society of Plant Biology, and others. He told me before this he doesn't like long introductions, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Gary, who's going to present on the subject, Potential of Biological Nitrogen Fixation to Impact Sustainable Global Food Production. Thank you, Gary. see if I can figure out how to use this thing. Um, I also want to thank uh, Maurice for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come up here. I've had a chance to come up here a few times. I'm actually tempted to buy a house here in case the election in November goes the, goes the wrong way. Um, and um, although I am very grateful for the opportunity to talk, um, I'm not grateful for the opportunity to follow Ruth. She's, uh, she's quite an act to follow. So. Um, I do, though, appreciate the fact that uh, biological nitrogen fixation is given such a prominent position in this meeting because it's not a normal situation for these types of uh, food-focused uh, meetings. Uh, the picture that you see in front of you uh, shows uh, soybean. It's a little blurry, and I apologize for that, but it basically shows soybean, and those that are dark green are inoculated with rhizobium, and those that are yellowish are, are not inoculated. So you can see the impact of biological nitrogen fixation on growth. Um, um, since I was one of the first speakers in the meeting, I thought I would show a few slides to define the problem, and I, I know I'm kind of um, sp speaking to the converted here, but there may be a few in the audience. So here's the kind of trends that we see uh, since the 60s. The, we all talk about the growth in uh, population, the need for increased uh, uh, food production, the, the uh, increase in food consumption, and also a huge increase in the application of fertilizer nitrogen. And, the, of course, the reason why we're here is that a large percentage of the population is undernourished. Um, I'll remind you of this uh, cover story from Time in 2005, which lists the five things that we could do to end poverty. And now, a decade later, I would, I would argue that there's been very little progress, at least in, number one, boosting agriculture. The amount of new money that's going into agriculture is still relatively limited. And I think Ruth made comment to the fact that uh, in the recent budget, if I understood it correctly, in Kenya, there was really no increase for funding uh, for agriculture. So unfortunately, and especially in the United States, many of our politicians view agriculture as a situation of excess and not a, a situation of limitation. 
I, and there, I think many of our politicians and also public in general think that the, that the cost of inaction is much less than the cost of action. And yet we see here, this is a slide that probably many of you have seen from a, a review by Nina Fedorov that shows the food price index versus occasions of food riots across the world. And so the price of, there is a price for inaction and that's social unrest as well as cost in dollars and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, sitting and doing nothing uh, actually does cost us quite a lot. Um, again, there's a huge need for increasing food production. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, you know, I deal with a lot with soybean farmers in the U.S., and I think soybean farmers in the U.S. would like to think that the food problem could be solved by export alone. But here we see that, um, that most food production is actually consumed in country. So for us to have a significant impact on food production, we have to actually be able to work in those countries and improve their local, local production. <clears throat> and of course, we all see the trends that the um, uh, that we're actually doing very well as as far as breeding and increasing uh, crops and agronomic pri um, practices. <clears throat> but from the standpoint of the amount of arable land, there's really no significant increase in that. And then again, we see these spike spikes in uh, in uh, food prices. And then when we look at production, we see that probably the two most limiting things as far as production and that's shown here on the right-hand side of this slide, is water and nitrogen. <clears throat> and, um, and so uh, it's, it's difficult to produce water or do much about water, um, but we can do something about, about nitrogen. And of course, here we see that in high-income countries, the amount of nitrogen fertilizer is, is increased, but pretty much leveled off. But of course, in low-income countries, there's been a significant increase in the use of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and it's not an accident that on the left-hand side of this, uh, this, this figure you can see that the green line, which shows the increase in synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use, is almost parallel with the increase in population. And we see that, that um, um, in a lot of cases that the increase that we've seen in crop production has actually been breeding for nitrogen response. Uh, and that's certainly true, for instance, in the case of rice. <clears throat> and we also see that a large increase on the, on the um, I guess, on my right, I guess you're right too, um, that a lot of the increase in crop production has come in the grasses and not, for instance, in the pulses, which was mentioned, uh, which was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so, um, so as we breed for increased nitrogen response, there is significant evidence that we're breeding out the ability to interact with beneficial bacteria, including beneficial bacteria that can fix nitrogen. And we have the global nitrogen fertilizer distribution problem in that, for instance, if you see here in, uh, I'm sure that green that goes up into Canada is largely uh, here in Saskatchewan, uh, but U.S., of course, but then if you see in Africa where Ruth is from or down in South America, uh, you see very little nitrogen fertilizer use. And so we have the problem that in many, reasons, in many regions of the world it's overused and in other re regions of the world it's underused. And yet when we add nitrogen fertilizer, we know it's relatively inefficient. And so maybe uh, no more than 50% of the nitrogen fertilizer that's added actually ends up in the plant. A lot of it is lost and a lot of that comes out as runoff and that can have deleterious effects on the environment and including coming off as gaseous products, which can also have deleterious effects on the climate. An example of this always pointed to is the impact in the, uh, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico here in the Gulf of California from runoff uh, from agricultural lands, which causes eutrophication, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and so on and so forth. And again, there, there is a cost for, uh, for inaction. In this case, these are actually dollars. This is data from Europe. Uh, showing in the left-hand side the cost in, to the European Union in billions of euros um, of, to the effect of nitrogen pollution, either on human health, ecosystem, or climate. So again, um, a lot of our politicians say if we don't do anything, it's not going to cost us anything, but of course there are these hidden costs, and these are costs to government, they're costs to industry, there's costs to society. And a lot of people perhaps think that we've, we've overdone it from the standpoint of uh, taking care of the planet. This is an interesting article in Nature that basically says that from the standpoint of the, the nitrogen cycle, we've exceeded the um, balance 
uh, from the state of, of biodiversity loss, climate change, and also human interference with the nitrogen cycle. So we're not being good stewards of our, of our, of our planet, at least from the standpoint of uh, the nitrogen cycle. So that's kind of the problem. Uh, how do we mitigate that challenge? One is di dietary choice. If we move from animal uh, uh, food to more plant products, uh, that would be beneficial. But uh, with the exception perhaps of California, most every place else is going in the opposite direction. Um, and that is that at, we see as developing countries become more developed, they switch more and more to meat products uh, for, their, for their diet. Examples in Asia, I was just in Asia a few days ago, uh, where as um, society gets more affluent, uh, rice consumption goes down and the production and the uh, consumption of animal protein goes up. I was mentioned, um, Maurice mentioned the idea of uh, food waste. But there's a number of things that we could do in agriculture from the standpoint of nitrogen use efficiency. And some of that includes the use of uh, intelligent use of nitrogen fixation, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. So if we look then at what uh, is extant now in agriculture, of course, legumes are very, very important. But there's really only about 15 legumes that are grown very widely. That red circle represents the nitrogenase enzyme, which is actually the enzyme in bacteria that fixes nitrogen. Biological nitrogen fixation is strictly a prokaryotic process, but that means that it can only be carried out by bacteria, and therefore if eukaryotes, uh, such as plants, uh, carry out nitrogen fixation, they have to do it in conjunction uh, with bacteria. And on the left there is, uh, is root nodules growing on a, on a legume. And of course, when we're looking at legumes, soybean is king. It's the number one uh, legume grown worldwide. It's a plant, that, of course, that I work on. But if you look at soybean production, it's primarily three major countries, US, Brazil, and Argentina. Although clearly, as we heard, there's increasing production in other parts of the world, such as in Africa. Now, if we look at other kinds of things, of course, we also have forage legumes, such as alfalfa. And uh, one of the trends that's uh, occurring now in the U.S. is uh, using a lot more cover crops, and that would include things like alfalfa, and that can also contribute significantly to soil health and to agriculture in general, as well as serving as a forage for animal production. And then we also had mentioned earlier the idea that there can be nitrogen carryover from these legumes, and so there's an indirect effect, especially when we use these in crop rotations, where nitrogen fixation occurs in the legume crop and then the subsequent crops such as wheat or corn can utilize that nitrogen. Here's an example, this, this is a slide from Mark Peoples in uh, CSIRO and they estimate based on data from Australia, North America and Europe that if you follow um, uh, with wheat after, after a legume and the legumes are shown there in the upper left, you can get an extra 1.2 tons of wheat per hectare due to that nitrogen carryover. So legumes have this uh, tradition of being able to enrich the soil. And so using rotation in this way as a way in which nitrogen fixation directly benefits now, not in the future, uh, agricultural production. But we also have to think in terms of the fact that there's great diversity out there in the number of nitrogen fixing symbioses. Uh, we only use just a few of those. And so there's also an opportunity perhaps to tap in to many of these other legumes. And so there's about 18,000 species of legumes. Now, not all of those are nodulated, not all of those fix nitrogen, but many of them do. And so these unexploited legumes can be an untapped tool for genetic diversity, and perhaps more needs to be done in maybe utilizing these in crop rotations or as, as cover crops or ways to increase uh, soil fertility. Okay, now um, the other thing is inoculation. So here's a slide from uh, Mary Angela Hungria in Brazil. Again, similar to what I showed you. The first slide, soybean plants either are inoculated, which are the darker colors, or uninoculated. Um, and so uh, Brazil uh, soybean production benefited by the importation of rhizobium inoculant from the United States when uh, uh, production of soybean took off in Brazil, say, roughly 50 years ago. And here's an example again from Mary Angela. Uh, I don't know how um, current these numbers are, but in this slide she says that uh, nitrogen fixation in soybean brings about six million tons of nitrogen into Brazilian soils. And according to her, only about 2.9 million tons of nitrogen of fertilizer are used. And so there's twice as much nitrogen being added to Brazilian soils by nitrogen fixation 
than by the use of, uh, uh, use of fertilizer. That wouldn't be the case, for instance, in the United States. And here's a, another slide from her on inoculation. And so there is a lot of efforts into Africa and another one that's being funded by the Gates Foundation of actually trying to move inoculant technology into developing countries. Here's some examples in Cowpea, where the, the bars that are higher are those in which there's been inoculants uh, brought in from Brazil and tried in these, um, in these uh, sites. And so there's a, a long history of this as I said, from the U.S. into Brazil about 50 years ago and, and now in other places. But, but it remains problems from the standpoint of inoculant quality and uh, access to, to inoculants. And I know that into Africa, for instance, Ken Jiller, this is one of the things that he's focused on in Africa. So it, re it remains a problem. But this is kind of a low-cost effort that can have a, a big significant impact if it's, if it's done properly. Now, there actually has, uh, many of you may think that inoculant technology is quite old, and so it's, it's stayed the same over time, but that's not true. This just shows one example of that in the inoculant carriers. So when you add an inoculant, you add it as a carrier. The carrier makes it easier for the farmer to apply, <clears throat> but it also extends the life of the inoculant. So prior, if you look down at the bottom right, in 1990, liquid um, carriers came around. Prior to 1990, if you were in the inoculant business, you never knew what your profit was until the end of the season. Because what you would do is that you would sell your product to the various outlets in the, uh, in the winter, and then it would get sold to the farmers, but you would have a buyback program. And that is at the end of the, end of the season, if there was any inoculant that wasn't bought, your company would buy that back. And the reason why you did that was to maintain quality because it didn't have a long shelf life. And so that was a very difficult business product not to know what your profit was until, until you actually bought back the product. And, uh, but in the liquid inoculant came around, that gave it a much longer shelf life, made it easier to supply and was a, a big boon to, to the inoculant industry. Now I've worked with companies such as Novozymes on some other technology. Uh, this is the so-called uh, LCO, which stands for lipokaido oligosaccharide technology. A couple of our patents are behind, behind this. Um, the LCO basically is the structure on the bottom right. It's a lipokaido oligosaccharide molecule. It's basically the primary signal that rhizobium use to actually initiate nodulation on the plant. And I won't go into the, the, the dirty details of this. But this shows a, a slide where in the center there at the top, the LCO is recognized by receptors by the plant and then triggers this nodule development on the right-hand side. The other thing which has come about out of this, this kind of research, which is quite interesting, is that these LCOs are also signals that are used by mycorrhizae. And they're now we know that this kind of straight line going down the middle represents a common pathway, which is used not only by nodulation, but also by mycorrhizae. And this is important, as I'll talk to you in a few minutes, about efforts to actually create, say, nitrogen-fixing corn. And the idea there is, since corn is already mycorrhizal, this central pathway already exists in corn. And so if we were trying to develop a nodulated corn, all we'd have to do is add, say, the ability to recognize the nod factor and perhaps the ability to form this nodule structure. But this central pathway, which is in common between rhizobium and nodulation, we wouldn't have to engineer into the corn plant. And here's an example from a recent paper from my lab where we've actually shown that this LCO actually has activity on other plants such as corn. And in this case, we're showing that the LCO increases root, root growth on, on corn. So there maybe is a possibility for using these type of gr uh, plant growth uh, promoting chemicals uh, as ways to stimulate um, not only legumes but also non-legumes. And I believe that Novozymes is actually has a product or is working on a product that could be applied to maize. So, if we then look at world food production, you know, most world food production is in cereals, and so I've been talking about pulses, and we can get nitrogen from pulses for cereals from, from carryover uh, during rotation, but can we do anything directly for cereals to get cereals to fix nitrogen? And then, again, here are the major cereals that are produced, and uh, of course, wheat here in Saskatchewan is very important. <clears throat> there was an interesting paper, this is, comes from J.K. Lada, who some of you may know, who has been with Erie for many, many years. And in this paper, I, I recommend that you look at it. Um, 
what, what they did is that they did a meta-analysis, which means that they didn't do any new experiments. They just looked at what was already in the literature. And they looked at using nitrogen balance studies in maize, rice, and wheat over the last 50 years. And so they measured, you know, the amount of nitrogen that was in the seed, they measured the amount of nitrogen that was in, um, in the soil, and, and so on and so forth. And they came, they came up that roughly 24% of the nitrogen that was in the crop could not be accounted for by those sources. And so they, they suggested that that 24% was actually coming from associative nitrogen fixation. So if these figures are true, it means that in cereals globally over the last 50 years, a biological nitrogen fixation has indeed played an important agricultural role, although one that, one that uh, people have not really focused on. And these numbers are really not much different than numbers that you see in sugarcane in Brazil, which has always been put up as kind of the model of where associative nitrogen fixation is playing a role. And I call it associative not nitrogen fixation because it's not the typical kind of rhizobium nodulation, kind of intimate symbiosis that you see where you form a unique structure, a nodule in the roots. Uh, in this case, the bacteria colonize the plant, fix the nitrogen, but there's no uh, physical structure um, that's formed, and they're not intracellular, they're intercellular. <clears throat> and here's some data from Michael Lavardi at the Nobel Foundation where they've also looked at switchgrass as a bioenergy crop, and they've used the settling reduction, which is a surrogate for looking at nitrogen fixation, and have found significant amount of, uh, of fixation in switchgrass. And there's been some um, long-term uh, studies, one of which was at Rothamsted, uh, where they've actually looked at these kind of bioenergy crops with very low inputs over very long periods of time, and as further evidence that there, there in fact, there is, is significant levels of nitrogen fixation uh, occurring in these plants. Although mechanistically we know very, very little about this, it, um, the anecdotal evidence indicates that it doesn't exist and it can be very important. Now the bacteria that carry out this associative nitrogen fixation are members of the so-called plant growth promoting rhizo rhizobacteria, PGPRs, <clears throat> and they, um, they fix nitrogen but can also have uh, plant growth promoting properties uh, via other kinds of mechanisms. And one of the things that's been happening in the industry um, say over the last 10 years, uh, certainly over the last five years, is kind of a reinvigoration of the whole idea of biologicals. Uh, biologicals being these kinds of bacteria, these kind of biological treatments that you can add to plants. And you might think that this is being driven by the science, and certainly there is good science there, but a lot of it's actually being driven by changes in the industry. Example is seed treatments. And so in the US, for instance, um, uh, now it's quite common, for instance, if you buy soybean, um, uh, you actually get a seed treatment of, say, fungicide, and that seed treatment is added at the co-op. And so the farmer then very easily can just call up the co-op, order the seed, and have the seed treatment applied. And that removes the hassle of him having to add the inoculant uh, on when he's on the tractor. And that's made acceptance of these kinds of biologicals much, uh, um, a lot more acceptance of these kinds of biologicals simply because they're easier to apply. And I think the major companies are seeing this and you're seeing major companies buy up these kinds of biological focused uh, companies uh, or enter into uh, um, uh, agreements such as Monsanto with Novozymes. And there clearly are products that are coming out. Now these biologicals are just starting to be used, uh, say, in North America. But in South America, where I go and, and consult uh, quite often, uh, there is a, quite a thriving industry in some of these PGPRs. <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned to you, these uh, plant growth promoting bacteria can colonize both the surface of the plant, but also get inside the plant, get to very high numbers, say up to the 10 to the 10th uh, per gram tissue, but don't elicit any kind of innate immunity response. So they're not seen by the plant as pathogens, and again, can be quite beneficial to the growth of the plant. An example of such a bacterium is azospirillum which is a nitrogen-fixing PGPR, and there is, in fact, commercial inoculant sold in South America um, uh, that's applied to uh, sugarcane, wheat, corn, and, and some other crops. Um, it's not widely used, I mean, it's not, uh, but it's, uh, it is a significant market, and, and some of the major companies are selling these inoculants. Um, here's an example of some data from a colleague of mine, Fabio Pedrosa, which is in uh, southern Brazil in um, uh, Curitiba. And it shows here that um, if, you add, if you look at the controls versus the, the far right, 
where, where they've added a bit of nitrogen, a, a limiting amount of nitrogen as well as this inoculant, they're getting significant increase in yield. And again, one of the effects of this is to increase root growth and in fact a common effect of adding these bacteria is to increase root growth. And that also has other beneficial effects, for instance, by making the plant more drought tolerant. Now we've been interested in this uh, to follow more the mechanism because a lot of this, uh, a lot of the work that's been published has been more phenomenology and there's been a lot of um, skepticism about uh, the use of these uh, kinds of treatments. And a lot of that skepticism has come from, I think, a lack of understanding of the mechanism, but also the fact that it's um, kind of hit or miss. You know, this field would work well, the other field, it doesn't work. And we really don't know uh, what's behind all that variability. So we've tried to develop <coughs> a model system, and this is uh, Ceteria which is a C4 weed, basically, but it's closely related to some of the bioenergy grasses, and uh, we've been uh, using this as a model system. And, and uh, we've been looking at this from the standpoint of using these PGPR bacteria, such as Azospirillum, Herbospirillum, and another one called Azoarchus. The Herbospirillum and Azoarchus are endophytes, and Azospirillum is an is a epiphyte. It grows on the surface of the roots. And uh, in a paper that we published in Plant Journal, and I, I recommend it to you, where we, we used um, working with people up at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, we were able to use N13, which has a half-life of 10 minutes, and C11, which has a half-life of 20 minutes, to look at the effects of uh, inoculation on nitrogen fixation, but also on the overall physiology of the plant. And uh, what's come out of that is that when we inoculate uh, these plants with uh, normal wild type bacteria, we can show that about 7% of their daily nitrogen requirement is provided by nitrogen fixation. And so using these radioisotope, we can show that the nitrogen is fixed, we can show that it's transported in the plant, we can show it's incorporated into protein. But 7% is probably not really agronomically relevant. But if we use another bacteria, in this case is a bacteria that fixes nitrogen but excretes ammonia, and this is a mutation in the enzyme glutamine synthetase, we actually find much higher levels of fixation, and now we can provide 16-fold higher levels of nitrogen, and that level is actually sufficient to provide all of the nitrogen for the plant's daily nitrogen demand. And that's shown in this figure here. If you look on the left is the ceteria growing with sufficient nitrogen, 5 millimolar nitrate, uh, the second from the left shows the uninoculated culture growing under limited nitrate. And then if you go all the way to the far right, you'll see these are plants growing under limited nitrogen, but inoculated with this nitrogen excreting uh, bacteria. And sh you can see that the growth of that plant is uh, basically equivalent to the one that's growing with combined nitrogen. Now, although these are glasshouse and greenhouse, uh, uh, glasshouse experiments, and I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't say that we can take them into the field, I think it does show the potential that there is the potential then for these bacteria to be used actually in, it, in an agriculturally significant way uh, to fix nitrogen and allow plants, plants to grow. The other, perhaps the most uh, compelling uh, data from that paper is if you look on the far left, this shows the distribution of various metabolites in plants growing under high levels of combined nitrogen. The center shows the same distribution under limiting nitrogen, and on the right, uh, growth of limiting nitrogen uh, inoculated with these bacteria. And I think you can just see by looking at the color distribution that the inoculated plants are much more similar to the plants grown under com high combined nitrogen than they are plants growing under limited nitrogen. So by all of these kinds of per parameters, including looking at the effects of metabolism, we can show the effects of nitrogen fixation and are having a significant impact um, on, on plant growth. So there's a lot of potential there, although it's still untapped. Now, how about biotechnology? And um, I, I didn't know the program when I put the slides together, but it's very interesting that we're about to have a, a discussion about biotechnology. This is from a review from 2014 written by um, a couple of friends of mine, Giles Orroy and, and Ray Dixon, who are very knowledgeable in this area. It, it also happens just coincidentally to um, uh, re uh, refer to two projects that are funded by the Gates Foundation. So in the upper portion, that, that's meant to represent the uh, synthetic biology approach where you actually take the genes for nitrogen fixation out of the bacteria and actually express those genes in the mitochondria and therefore make the plant nitrogen fixing. And that is the plant will actually be expressing the enzymes for nitrogen fixation. 
the bottom, uh, the bottom example is the idea of uh, nodulated corn. That is, take the symbiotic system that exists in rhizobium and actually transfer it uh, to corn. <clears throat> and the, the latter one, the idea that we can actually carry out this, uh, make nodulated corn, if you will, it comes from this rationale that now that we know a lot about how the plant is recognizing symbiotic signals and inducing nodule formation, now we have the sufficient information to begin to engineer those kinds of traits into the maize plant. And again, I mentioned to you the fact that you have this commonality between nodulation and mycorrhizae, suggesting that you don't have to engineer every gene, that corn, since it's already mycorrhizal, already has many of those genes. And so Giles, for instance, and many colleagues are funded by the Gates Foundation to pursue this kind of avenue. The other thing to think about is that now as we know more and we've done more looking at the diversity of these kinds of symbioses, we find on the far left, example being alfalfa, that it's a very sophisticated kind of mechanistic um, uh, system that leads to the symbiosis. But there's other systems such as uh, Suspania, which is a nodulated tree in the middle, and where it's a much, much more simple kind of system and we don't seem to have the same kind of degree of complexity. And then all the way to the right, uh, which rec is rec um, represented by some, uh, some uh, trees, uh, tropical trees like Ascanomini, you can actually have a system where you can dispense with all this kind of nod factor LCO technology and actually just get direct infection of the plant and still get sufficient nitrogen fixation. And so it's possible then using these kinds of, of systems as models as opposed to say alfalfa, we might actually be able to engineer a nitrogen fixing corn by adding much fewer functions than what was otherwise um, realized until a few years ago. Now, getting back then to the, the synthetic approach, um, I did work on this when I was a postdoc um, many years ago. And um, we now know all the genes involved in nitrogen fixation. We know their function. The center there, B, represents the crystal structure of the enzyme that carries out nitrogen fixation. It's composed of uh, uh, basically two subunits. One is a molybdenum iron protein, and the other is an iron sulfur protein, uh, one being the, uh, the iron protein being NIFH, the molybdenum iron protein actually being uh, encoded by two genes, NIF, K, and D. The, one of the difficulties with these proteins from the standpoint of engineering them into, say, corn, is that um, in addition to the genes, the structural genes for the proteins for nitrogenase, you have to build these metal clusters. And so you have to build the four iron, four sulfur cluster, you have to build this so-called P cluster, and then the very difficult one is this FIMOCO uh, cluster, which is unique to nitrogenase. It doesn't really exist anywhere else. And so there's a number of genes that are required just to make those metal clusters and insert those into the proteins, and that's, that's a huge challenge. But there's uh, active work in this area, and again, uh, uh, some of this is funded by the Gates Foundation. This is a, a paper from Chris Voigt that was in PNAS, where they showed using very, very engineering practices, real synthetic biology, that they can refactor this uh, nitrogenase gene cluster in such a way that they can control it precisely and express these uh, proteins and also optimize nitrogen fixation. Now, this wasn't done in, entirely in bacteria. A very interesting paper came out, this should be 2016, not 2015, in Nature Communication, and this again is from a group that's funded by the Gates Foundation. And where, what they did is they took one of the proteins, NIF-H, which again requires one of these iron sulfur clusters, and actually expressed it in mitochondria in yeast, and were able to show that they could actually uh, uh, retrieve active nitrogenase protein out of yeast. And since that required the iron sulfur cluster, and since they didn't add the enzymes to make that iron sulfur cluster, it indicates that that NIF-H protein was actually able to use the iron sulfur clusters that are normally made in mitochondria in order to reconstitute the active protein, suggesting again that perhaps we can make this nitrogenase by adding fewer genes than we otherwise thought we could. Now, of course, the NIF-H protein is much easier than actually making the molybdenum iron uh, uh, protein, which is still a challenge. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind is that nitrogenase is inherently extremely oxygen sensitive, and so if it's exposed to any oxygen at all, it loses activity. And so there's a number of challenges that, uh, that remain. But this still is a landmark in the fact that we've taken the first step to actually be able to do this synthetically in yeast, and of course if you can do it in yeast, you can probably do it in corn. 
Now, um, a recent paper some of you may have missed was a paper in science, which is really very exciting. And a, a, one of the things about nitrogen fixation is it's very energy uh, requiring, but it also requires a lot of reductant. And that reductant, of course, is provided in, in bacteria by, you know, by uh, uh, electron donors like uh, ferrodoxin and, and flavodoxin. Um, and then that goes into the NIF-H protein, which is the center glob, and then the NIF-H protein transfers those electrons to the molybdenum myron protein. Now, in this paper, what they did was really exciting. They took a cadmium sulfur nanorod using nanotechnology, and they actually bound that to the proteins. And they could then shine light on that system and actually use light to provide the electrons to support nitrogen fixation. Now, that doesn't get around the issue of oxygen sensitivity, but if this could actually be scaled up, then um, instead of using natural gas like we do now to make synthetic nitrogen, we could actually use light to drive uh, the production of ammonia for fertilizer production. So it's quite an exciting finding. On the top panel there shows the natural system and where the reductant and electrons are coming from from ATP and electron donors inside the cell, and the bottom then rec uh, represents this new system and where the electrons are actually coming from light that's being absorbed by these nanoparticles, these cadmium sulfur nanorods. And on the left here, you can see the century-old Haber-Bosch process, which is the process by which we now make synthetic nitrogen. It uses about 3 to 5 percent of the global nat natural gas consumption, <clears throat> which represents about 1 to 2 percent of the global, global energy usage. And so there's a huge carbon footprint for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer production. Now, on the right then represents this new system that could actually use light. Now, that doesn't get around a lot of the environmental effects of ammonia because it's still if you're going to add ammonia as a fertilizer, you're going to have runoff, you're going to have a lot of these other kinds of effects but it would greatly reduce the carbon footprint of, um, of uh, synthetic uh, nitrogen fertilizer production. But again, there's huge challenges from a paper from science to an industrial scale process, and not, not the least of which is you've got to be able to protect the enzyme from, from oxygen, as I mentioned. But still, uh, an exciting, um, exciting paper and a, a, a nice demonstration of the use of these kinds of new technologies. So, some final personal thoughts and recommendations. So, I hope I've convinced you that biological nitrogen fixation is and will continue to contribute to sustainable food production. I hope I've also con convinced you that progress is being made along a wide front, all the way from, you know, the use of, uh, of legumes and cropping systems to trying to develop uh, uh, nitrogen-fixing corn to even industrial processes where we can actually fix nitrogen using light. Uh, one of the, the um, complaints that I've always had is that if you talk to the major corporations, you know, they want one rhizobium that can inoculate every soybean in the world. Um, but we know because of genotype and environment interactions, there's a lot of variability. E example, when we've done our work with PGPR and we screen a variety of genotypes of a given species, we find that only about 10% of the genotypes that we, we screen actually respond to the PGPR. And so that means that 90% of the plants that are out there, probably because of the, the way they've been bred for nitrogen response, either don't have or have lost this ability to respond to PGPR. And so um, that may in fact be a significant um, driver of this variability that we see in the field when these kinds of technologies are trying to be uh, applied. There are some relatively low, uh, low tech and cost solutions. An example is improvement of inoculant quality and performance, which I mentioned into Africa is trying to do this in Africa now, and there's been other, other um, uh, ideas behind this, uh, perhaps also involving a, a wider range of legume species and crop rotations. Is nitrogen fixing corn feasible? Um, I personally think that the synthetic biology approach is probably uh, quite feasible. The nodulated corn I'm a little bit more skeptical of, but who knows, the people that are doing it are very bright, and I'm sure that they'll achieve it if it's achievable. But then you have to ask the question about economic viability. About 30% of the, of the photosynthate of a soybean plant goes into the nodules to support nitrogen fixation. So if you had, actually had a corn plant that fixed nitrogen, then one would assume about 30% of its photosynthate would actually go to nitrogen fixation, which one would assume would reduce the yield of the corn plant. Um, and so there's a question about its economic viability. 
And then uh, I've, had, I've gone up to many farmers in the U.S. and said, you know, if I can increase your profitability at the cost of yield, would you agree to it? And without a, without a hesitation, they've all said absolutely not. So farmers in developing countries will not give up yield. And the reason why they won't give up yield is that they know year in and year out, regardless of environmental conditions, if they focus on yield, they're probably going to do all right. If they focus on other kinds of things, then there could, they could actually have a bad year. So if that's true, if we can't get farmers in developing countries to take a corn plant that fixes its own nitrogen but at a decrease of yield, then that then limits what's possible, how it can be funded. And again, the projects that I told you about are funded by the Gates Foundation, not by the National Science Foundation, and where also they might be applied. And so, so th this may actually be a boon, say, to developing agriculture, but perhaps not be um, well accepted in developing countries. And then agriculture, including biological nitrogen fixation, is in great need of significant increase in research funding if we're going to meet the needs of sustainable food production in such a way that we protect our environment and our way of life. And again, I think our, our politicians um, think that there's no cost to inaction. And also, at least in the U.S., I think f view agriculture as a situation of excess and not a situation of limitation. And so we have a lot of... Um, a lot of um, a, pushing the rock up the hill, I think, to, uh, to really increase the amount of funding that we get um, for agriculture. But, but these kinds of meetings and the kind of discussions we're having here, I think, are very important. So I just want to, one final slide to show our who, the kind of people that have funded our research. And on the left there, the, the people, the names of the people that are in my lab now. And before I end, I wanted to thank uh, Mark Peoples, Michael Lavardi, Perry Gustafson, and Mary Angela Hungria, who shared very generously of some of the slides and uh, some of which I was able to show you uh, today. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Interesting uh, and intriguing uh, paper, uh, Doctor. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Lauren Hepworth of the Global Institute for Food Security. Would you care to look into your crystal ball and speculate on timelines when some of this really interesting stuff might be uh, commercially <coughs> viable and available? Well, you know, from the standpoint of the ca cadmium sulfur thing, I think you need somebody more from in, in the industry that can argue to that because I. I, I could see it taking a long time to upscale that kind of technology. For, uh, uh, some years ago, when the Gates Foundation was considering these kinds of things, I, was, I went to a meeting in, in Seattle at the Gates Foundation. And um, at that time, I thought that they were looking at what to fund. And at that time, I thought they would fund associative nitrogen fixation because, as I explained to you, it's kind of a system that already exists naturally. And so for it to, to increase its agricultural acceptance, we just need to kind of enhance it. Um, but, in fact, in the, but, but in fact, what came out on top at that Gates Foundation meeting was actually the synthetic biology approach, that after we saw the science behind it and the new technologies coming around, we thought that if anything was going to work, it was probably the synthetic biology approach. And I still think that that's probably true. And so, you know, we may, we may only be 10 years or maybe even less from away from a nitrogen-fixing yeast and uh, that's the model system that they're using. And of course, a nitrogen fixing yeast by itself, let's say, let's use a nitrogen fixing yeast to, uh, with, to make uh, dry distiller greens, for instance, and which would probably greatly increase the nitrogen content, make it a much better animal feed, for example. So there's big usages for nitrogen fixing yeast. Uh, but of course, if you can do it in yeast, you can probably do it in, in corn. The question then really comes in that if, it, that let's say if we had nitrogen fixing corn in 20 years, um, is it really economically viable? And you know that's the kind of question you probably can't answer until you actually do it. And you know, see if you know if the, if the plant is only three inches tall when you get done, um, you know it's not very useful. But maybe another ten years of optimizing it, you know, can get it up to where to where it's actually um, you know production scale. So, so I I think nitrogen fixing corn, you know, twenty to thirty years off nitrogen fixing yeast much closer. Um, the nodulated corn thing, um, if Giles was standing here, I'd say, well, you know, probably he's not here, so I'd say, mm, I'm a little skeptical of that. But, uh, but, uh, but, you know, Giles and the other people are working with him, these are some of the brightest people that I know. So, so there are no doubt they're going to find very interesting things, and if it can be done, they'll, they'll accomplish it, I'm sure. John 
Johannes de Bruyne published the article in the 70s about uh, tropical grasses fixing nitrogen. The mechanism of uh, corn fixing nitrogen the same that she explained 40 years ago? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I know Joanna and I know many of her papers. I don't know exactly which one you're talking about. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the nitrogenase enzyme is the same. And in sugarcane, there's this bacteria called gluconoacetobacter, which actually grows in the leaves and, and uh, actually grows under very high sugar concentration and is thought to be responsible for most of the nitrogen fixation that goes on there. Where we're really, you know, and I mentioned in the case of uh, the rhizobium, we know enough about the mechanism now that people are postulating actually transferring that from one plant to another. Unfortunately, the research on associated nitrogen fixation has lagged, and so we don't have the same level of understanding. We don't have the level of understanding of what uh, compounds are being exchanged, uh, what nutrients are being exchanged. We don't really understand the signaling that's taking place. We don't really understand the infection mechanism by which these bacteria can get in and become endophytes. And so this is one of the reasons we're trying to develop a model system uh, where we can start to tear this apart both biochemically and genetically. And, and we're making some progress, and I think other people are interested in doing the same thing. So it's, it's surprising that it's took, taken so long to kind of mainstream uh, science to, to get back and start asking these basic questions, but, but you know, better late than never. Good, thanks. Yeah, happy to meet you again. We were in the same taxi yesterday. <laughs> I didn't know I was sitting next to you. Yeah, I was, I was asleep. It was like 12, 12 yeah. midnight, yeah. This is really exciting stuff, but what is really good also is in, uh, in Africa, we can make a lot of progress with current technology. Right, that's you right. Are, you are using your crystal, crystal ball question. We can move a lot. We are currently with the End to Africa project actually producing inoculants based on sterile <coughs> peat in Nigeria. Right. We sold $50,000 of packs last year for soybean. And what we've seen really, and what is really interesting, is soybean also needs phosphor. And phosphor is costly. No, because inoculant is so cheap. It's actually valorizing the investment in phosphor. In a sense, you could argue the fertilizer company should give the inoculant for free when they, when they sell, sell the phosphor fertilizer for legume production. So it's just more of a comment. The second comment I wanted to make is, you said there is less money for agriculture since 2005 or something. Well, I, I didn't say less. I'm just saying there hasn't been a huge increase. But there, is, there is a big change, and Professor Lal also said, you know, the yields are still one ton per hectare as they used to be 30 years ago. You can look at it with pessimistic glasses or with optim optimistic glasses. If you put on your pessim pessimistic glasses, this is what you say. If you look at your, with your optimistic glasses, you see a lot of progress in a lot of countries. The current yield in Ethiopia is now three tons per hectare for maize, not more one ton. Nigeria and Malawi are using almost 30 to 50 kilograms of fertilizer. So there is a lot of change, and that change is, is not a secret. If you look at where that change is happening, it's where governments are investing in agriculture. It's, it's not like a mystery. So there is a lot more money for agriculture in Africa. Not everywhere, not all the time, but these good examples are there. I just wanted to make that comment also, that we don't leave this room being, you know, desperate to know what we can do. There is a lot that is, that is currently happening. And with a bit more effort, that can actually probably double and triple in the next 10 years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't have any trouble getting up in the morning and going to work, so I'm, I'm optimistic too. Uh, uh, biologicals can also help with the phosphate situation because there certainly are phosphate solubilizing bacteria as well as fungi. And I know there's actually companies here in Canada that fun, sell fungi, for instance, for phosphate solubilization. So that's another place where biologicals can play a role. Is this one working? Yeah. And we do have a roving mic if people who are hemmed in a little bit need to, to ask a question. Gary, thank you so much for that. And uh, there's a lot of pro provocative science in there. Um, the, the, the suspicion that things like sugarcane were actually fixing nitrogen by uh, epiphytic means uh, or endophytic means uh, 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 raises the question as to whether we would ever be able to harness a process like that and intervene. Could you give us a, a sense as to what you think are the key discoveries that need to be made in order to give us a clue as to whether we could actually intervene and use a process like that as, you know, as an alternative to nodulation? What are the key things we need to know? 
Well, you know, from, from the optimistic point of view, I mean, that, the technology is already being used. So I showed you some data from uh, Fabio Pedrosa and with the azospirillum, but he, even he will admit that they see a significant impact of inoculation on sandy soils, which I take to be low nutrient soils. And even in our lab, if we have a plant that's growing under significant nitrogen, very healthy, we don't see any impact of inoculation of the bacteria. So these seem to be uh, working primarily under stress conditions and under low nutrient uh, conditions. But in those conditions, you can get a consistent response. And you know, the inoculant is being sold and is having a positive impact. Um, it's hard for me to answer the, the real, your real question simply because we know so little about these interactions and what's involved and mechanistically what's going on. So we really don't know what's limiting. And quite frankly, in most of the cases, we don't really have a clear idea of what's causing plant growth promotion. Uh, you know, a lot of it's been attributed to things like cytokine and auxin, other cases nitrogen fixation, other cases biocontrol, et cetera, et cetera. And it may be all of the above, but the kind of the, the mechanistic studies just haven't been done. Okay, I think we're going to draw to a close. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much, Gary, for that fascinating presentation. And now we're going to have a coffee break, so please be back sharp at 3.30 for this very interesting IQ squared debate. Thank you. Yes, and before everybody uh, leaves the room, uh, the IQ squared debate is in a different, uh, um, a, a, a different hall, um, which is down the far end of the corridor, and then you'll have to go down the stairs. If you can try and take your seats within 10 minutes of the start of the debate, that will give us an opportunity to get everybody who is a registered uh, conference attendee seated because some of the general public will also be coming for the debate. So uh, let's see if we can get everybody down there by about 10 minutes before the debate starts. Thank you. <laughs>